Um, so hi everyone, uh, I'm Mary. I think most of you I met at uh, Summit Brigade Day. Um, and I guess I guess a one community agreement I'll just add personally is if you're if you're not talking to please mute because we have a lot of people on the call. And I can hear at least one person. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so I, um, yeah, most of you met me at Brigade Day and I am a member of Seattle, of Open Seattle, and I'm also a consultant who does uh, impact measurement and developing impact measurement systems. And so I'm working with uh, Meredith and um, Veronica and Tom to develop this uh, impact measurement system. Uh, and what we're gonna talk about today is one potential way of doing impact measurement for the brigade and um, this piloting uh, project we have to kind of test it out because it's really new and get your input uh, on it and how you'd like to participate. So I have, I have some slides to kind of just get everyone on the same page and then there's kind of a choose your own adventure of what seems useful next. And um, as you can see, if you want to, there's a part of the presentation if we decide to do it that's interactive that involves creating impact cascades, which you'll learn about later. So that's why there's um, the bit.ly link. Um, but as you, you can also see this, the deck um, right here on the screen. So that's up to you. And I will do my best to look at chat as I'm speaking, um, but I, that Veronica is really good at, um, you know, raising issues that come up if I happen not to see them. Okay, so get started. Um, so everyone introduced themselves, which is great and I appreciate. Um, so yeah, so why are we here? Uh, so this is a review for people who are at Summit Brigade Day um, and just a quick getting up to speed for people who weren't, um, which I think is a few people on the call. Um, so we have this BHAG, uh, Big Hairy Audacious Goal, which is to create a social impact measurement system for the Brigade Network. Um, and we're going to discuss why we would do that and what that even means. Um, and I think one thing I'd just like to highlight at this stage, it, part of what makes it big and hairy and audacious is that it's something that needs to have a fair amount of um, similarity from brigade to brigade. So kind of we can look at, you know, apples, apples to apples or at least all different kinds of fruit, um, while also accounting for the fact that there is a lot of diversity and variety in what you're all doing. Um, so that's kind of the tension at play in, in this project, the core tension. Lower right panel of the slides covered, yeah, oh gosh, you can see that too. Um, yeah, does anyone know how to make that disappear? Because I sometimes I feel like it usually just disappears, but it's clearly not just disappearing. Any Google? If you take your mouse outside of the screen, it usually goes away. Mouse outside of the screen, okay. Um, you can use the full screen. Um, oh, full screen. screen? Awesome. Do the trick. Okay. Thank you. So, hey! Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. Okay. Yes. So, a shared approach that accounts for project diversity. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, I'm moving my, I'm trying to look at chat as well as doing things. Okay. So, first of all, what does, what does it mean to have, um, a social impact measurement system. So yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, so does someone uh, from Brigade Day maybe want to share a hand or I'll let Veronica be in charge of deciding who will speak um, to just share their understanding of what it means to have a social impact measurement system for the Brigade Network? Yes, please feel free to just unmute and share or, um, or put it in the chat, you think? Yep, yeah, either one. All right, um, I will, I can also say something just so that we can, can move along. Um, so, oh goodness. Yeah, so one way to think of it is a co-design method of rigorously 
taking into taking stock of benefits and harms created by brigade projects. And on Slack, there was a lot of interest in um, particularly in talking about harms, which we can certainly do. Um, those would be unintended harms, of course. Um, but that's kind of what we mean uh, when, we, when we talk about impact measurement. Um, yeah, as John also says, having a common way to show impact. Yeah, help regain to understand, implement one or more impact measures. Beautiful. Yeah, also correct. Um, so um, why are we doing this? Um, I'm going to start off with a couple and then we can uh, add in. So one reason is to know our collective benefit. Obviously, if there are any harms to undo them uh, or stop them, mitigate them. Um, and then the cascade method, because it provides ongoing information, the goal is that we actually increase our benefits because we have information of our outputs as we're creating things. Um, and so it's not just an evaluation at the end of a project where we say, how did that go? Um, it's more like we're in the middle of creating something and we're going to get some feedback about what's going on. And then hopefully we can actually work out problems or increase the impact as we're going. Um, so those are a couple of reasons to do this. Um, does anyone else have any other motivations that they feel are relevant to their own brigades? And this one, I will just step back because I don't have any particular answer. And via chat, or you can unmute yourself. Can we call on people? Can we just call on Jill? Uh, what was the question again? The question is, is there just anything else? Like any other reasons or motivations that you feel are relevant for why you might want to do impact measurement for, um, for your brigade or project? I feel like, okay, so for us, I feel like um, it's a constant struggle to not fall in the, we're doing tech and solving problems for ourselves. And instead, um, if we're always, if we're measuring the impact, then I can, we can make sure that the projects we're doing actually have an impact, aren't just a bunch of techies sitting around writing code for their own problems. Yep, totally agree with that. Yeah, any, anyone else have, Another reason, um, prioritizing efforts. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yes, we are recording this, Josh. Um, I'm just reading the chat out loud for those that are on potentially phone. Um, being responsive to our community, agreed. Yep. Okay, awesome. Cool. So uh, how are we doing this? Um, measuring impact forces in earlier conversation and design process about how and why of a project. Yeah, and ideally the impact measurement, this cascade that we're going to look at, it happens at the beginning of a project, but that's not always the case. So I agree just that it does kind of get people to think about, okay, who is our user again? Are we talking to them? Do we know if it's working even in this early stage? What kind of feedback are we getting? Um, that's so totally a function of doing an impact cascade. Um, so this is for people, we did, we did have Summit, you know, um, about a month and a half ago. Um, and then there's some people that weren't at Summit. So this is how we got to where we are and where we are. So at Summit, um, there was Brigade Day. Um, is this person with this amazing smile on the call? Because that would be really funny. <laughs> it was just definitely the best picture that came out of it. I do not think Andrew's here, but I am excited to show him that picture of himself. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so basically at Brigade Day, um, I and my colleague, um, Catherine, facilitated a session about impact measurement. And we had all people from probably Veronica, I think it was maybe 30 brigades, however many were at some. Yeah, um, a, bit, a bit more than that probably. A bit more than that, okay. Yeah. Um, and just had people record on post-its, which you can see there, um, the impacts that they felt their projects were having or that they wanted their projects to have. And I ended up with 128 different impacts that came off those post-its and basically put them in a spreadsheet and you can see a little chunk of that um, in that call out, that circular call out. Um, so you can see the kind of stuff that popped up. 
there was some illegible, there was some, you know, increasing trust in elections, decreasing corruption, increasing civic engagement, uh, creating reports, access to housing and jobs, um, access to transit. Um, and then I reviewed the data looking for patterns, right? Um, and so we can just take just a moment to kind of see the kind of stuff that you all came up with. Um, so, you know, in the first column, and this is sorted, this is a build. So if it seems sorted, it is sorted. But just to kind of get into the data a bit before we talk about the pattern, um, there were some, you can see that from the left, um, there's connection, inspiration, creating a network. So looking at things that are happening inside the brigade. Um, there were some um, functions of uh, benefits that were tightly connected to interacting with a piece of software, like number four in the second column, using distributed data, viewing complex data. And then from there out, it gets more the scope of the effect becomes or benefit becomes larger. So in the third column, you know, increasing care for trees, decreasing transit times, decreasing corruption, um, and then replication. So, so benefits that are outside even of the project itself that are about scaling and reuse. Um, so the pattern I came up with for taking account of all these impacts ended up looking like a cascade. Um, and a cascade meaning that there's a series of dependencies, causal dependencies, where if you're creating a positive impact at one point, that's going to fall over into the next. And also you kind of cannot create that later benefit without achieving the previous benefit. So for example, um, the transit example, I'm not sure what brigade or brigades that was, but that kind of showed up clearly along the cascade. So if you look at under tool users, um, empowering writers with data in the benefits for individuals, um, you would have a decrease in transit times, right? Um, and then for institutions or beyond a specific user, there is number five, decreasing traffic jams. So we're looking, starting at benefits to the brigade internally that make it a well-functioning unit that's creating projects. Um, that are then in turn being used and that benefit users um, that may also benefit other individuals. So another example of the transit is like a housing app where let's say a parent is searching for affordable housing, they find it because of the app or website and then of course their children also have access to that affordable housing. Um, and then there are also benefits to institutions that we can't really measure at the individual level like decreasing corruption decreasing traffic jams, increasing transparency. Um, and then finally, there are these um, benefits for other cities um, so that a project is replicated. So, so um, I feel like this might take a little bit of kind of just pausing and, and making sure that we're all on the same page about this. So does anyone have any thoughts, questions, observations just on this kind of, this cascade um, as a way of describing the impact of, of brigade projects? I have oh, a question. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to, let me, I, do you want to ask and then I'll read Josh, Joseph's or are the two questions in any way connected? Um, oh, thanks, Scott. Um, how did you gather the data to measure the impact? Like, so I guess, sorry, Jill, I guess I'm going to read Joseph's first. How did you gather the data to measure the impact? Like how many sheets of paper saved or ask people who use the app, how much time has been saved? Those kinds of questions. Um, Joseph, can you rephrase your question? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Yeah, I can try. Okay. <clears throat> um, so for like gathering these benefits of our projects, is it mm -hmm. that we need to um, interview kind of like, uh, I guess our shareholders or customers, like uh, for one of our projects that's deployed with the, the library and the YMCA, Mm -hmm. Do we just interview them be like, look, how many pieces of paper have you uh, saved or not purchased from using our application to now? Or how many hours have you saved? Like those kind of measurements, those kind of questions to gather that data that we need to measure these benefits? So that's, that's my feeling about this, is that most of the time measuring benefit means going 
it can usually, sometimes it can be measured only on the back end or only through digital trace data. And that's mm -hmm. great and convenient. And an example of that, I'm speculating here, but I would guess get Cal Fresh. They probably have some function within the app where you can see how many people have applied for food stamps. And that's great. They have digital trace data right in there that says this is how many people applied. And maybe they even have digital trace data about how many people received. Um, but I think for a lot of projects, it is going to require talking to people. And I feel like if there's, there's kind of awareness of that from the beginning of a project, there can be like one thing that's being asked and that there's kind of a plan to, you know, I guess the ideal is you're working with users and stakeholders throughout the process. And at some point in that process, once implementation has happened or launch has happened, you go back to those partners and, and users and you ask them about the effects that it's, that it's had on them. So it's kind of like if you're building in an engaged way with community and users, it should actually not be too intimidating to at least get some data um, mm -hmm. because you already have the relationships. That's if they respond. Uh, it took us a while to like, I always ask like any new features and like quiet for months. But they were still using it, so it was good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And that's, Eventually, they're like, no, it's, don't change anything. Just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah, and that's totally, yeah. totally normal. Um, okay. And for people, for you to ask for data or send out a survey and um, for people not to respond because they're just happy. They're like, it's good. Yeah. I don't need to tell them anything. It's great. Um, okay. And that's, that's kind of working around the edges, and sometimes a relationship is helpful in that, like, Oh my God, it's fine. But like this guy, I know, you know, just looks like good guys. So I'll take five minutes and tell him <laughs> what's going on. Um, Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, so I see. So um, Jill, do you want to ask your question and then I'll go back to the chat thread or make your comment? It was Jess who had a comment. Oh, okay. Uh, Jess, I'm reading yours. Okay. Impacts aren't always a cascade though, right? That is impacts on tool user on the tool users won't always cascade down to other individuals or cities. I'm thinking of something like a tool that allows someone to look up and access a service, for example, parking, paying a parking ticket. That impact doesn't necessarily cascade. So I would say, so I guess if you think of a cascade just as a series of dependencies where you're asking, okay, this is our final desired impact or goal is someone pays a parking ticket. What needs to happen before that? They need to, there's probably they need to know about the app. So there's like some promotion that needs to happen. The function, the app needs to have certain functionality, which may require, you know, working with a certain, getting the API to some kind of government services portal working through the app. Like there's, it's like, what are all those dependencies and um, kind of having in mind what that series of dependency is to get you to that final impact just so, so that it's almost like a working backwards kind of a, an approach right yeah yeah okay. so i think to say that there's not a cascade would mean that there's like we start and then doodly 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 it's impact right we're trying to say like what is the doodly 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 like let's be really explicit about that got it okay that yeah. makes sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and then you're getting more information and also sometimes people impact measurement stresses people out because they're like, I don't know. And so it's to kind of get you, the creator, out of that space of, I don't know. It's like, well, actually, we kind of know how things are going and it's not a, going to be a surprise at the end, you know, whatever happens. Tom, Get Cut Fresh does, goes to great lengths to obtain outcomes data, i.e. who approved and rejected from all the counties, which is just active. Measuring impact is hard and time consuming, but very important. Okay. Um, yeah, so that means they're doing, Tom, they're doing like, they're physically, getting on phone calls or changing, changing emails with the counties or, you know. A lot of CSV is going back and forth. Yeah, CSV right. is going back and forth. Right, yes. right, right, right. Um, cool. All right, so I'm gonna move along just so that you can kind of get to what the, this impact has Can I ask you a question, Mary? Really yes. Um, yes. I'm just kind of curious about the relative position of the columns. Um, mm -hmm. So um, one thing that strikes me is that sort of the individual column is in the middle. Um, I'm kind of curious. Um, sort of how the cascade goes, like, um, like it does it, like does it go left to right based off of, um, like how did, how did you come to that sort of agreement or that that sort of um, that sort of structure? Um, yeah, I guess it's it's left to right because we we read left to right and it's text. Oh yeah, but I guess I mean, yeah. but does it like does uh, is like what is the relationship? 
or like, is there a relationship? I guess I'm just kind of um, just sort of trying to understand the, the visual. Um, well, I guess, so, so things at the top left happen earlier than things at the bottom right. And then it's, there's a diagonal just to visualize this cascade. So to make it like gravity, you know, so, so it looks a bit like a waterfall. So this kind of assumes that the tool user is the primary stakeholder, right? It feels like this particular flow. Um, but what if, for example, the tool user is the city or city employees or right. like, is it possible that this cascade goes in different directions or in a different mm. sequence depending mm -hmm. on the project? Yeah. So a cascade, it doesn't, it doesn't have to have these particular phases, which is the next, there's a, there's, this is further generalized. I would say the user is always a person. So even if it's the city, there's a particular type of city employee who is the user. Um, and I do believe that the user, uh, attending to the needs of the user comes before measuring the positive effect on the user, comes before measuring institutional effects. Um, there could be other exam other there could be edge cases, but that's not true. But um, I do believe that the user is always an individual, even if they're embedded within an institution. Um, and I'm gonna because you're, we're now talking about generalizability. Um, is it bi-directional? I think not. But let's. So this is the model that that is we're trying to. We're, this is the model that we're testing now that we're piloting. So it has this cascade appearance. Um, the phases are labeled, but they're not identified specifically like they were on the previous slide. Um, and an impact is described for each phase. And then there are measurements, there are different metrics, and there are, um, and then there's timing that's identified just to kind of give it a little bit of a taste of a plan. Um, so it does generalize out from that a bit, but it's, it is linear. So, um, I feel like starting with this model and then altering it as needed is probably how I would account for something that ends up not being linear. Um, so, and we're, we do have the option of, and I think we probably will do it, of going through an example of this that, um, that Joe would describe about how this can look for an individual project. project. I do want to just get through the end of the, the challenge so at least the scope of what this piloting means is clear. Um, Cascade can be described as creator. Uh, you guys create the tool and people make use of the tool, then the people who benefit from the information and then, yeah, so it's kind of however, whatever makes sense in the flow of your own project. And I think there's many ways to do that. So, okay, so this is the challenge. Um, the challenge is to create a cascade, which means filling in that diagram on the previous slide for one of your projects um, by Brigade Congress, which is in mid-October. Um, and there are supports for doing that. There is coaching, which would be via video chat with myself, any, um, Brigade that does that would have that. And also there is um, unlimited tech support on the Brigade Impact Slack. Um, and we can talk about um, what, how, what kind of logistics might be to make this happen, right? Um, sitting, sitting down and doing it, I think you'll find it takes about an hour, um, but you might have additional logistics of selecting a project or getting a project lead to like be in the same room with you so you can sit down with them. Um, so we can talk about those kind of logistics, um, but that's the, sh the, the shape of the challenge itself. Um, does anyone have questions on, on, the, on this challenge, which were, this is the name of the pilot, is the Impact Cascade Challenge. Um, okay. Um, and then the kind of final phase of this challenge is actually going to Brigade Congress. Um, hopefully a number of you would be there 
and reflecting on, okay, we tried out this cascade on a project in our brigade, and this is what worked and this is what didn't. And then we kind of alter the cascade or the process or whatever didn't work. And then we find more brigades that are not the early adopters that you are to then test out the refined version. Um, and so that's the kind of, that is the full loop of this pilot that we're now proposing to you. Okay, does the project have to be completed close to it? Um, no, it doesn't have to be completed by Congress. This is a planning, the impact cascade is a planning document. So it's most useful if you do it at the beginning of a project. It can be done, as just implied, toward the middle of the project where it kind of forces you to be really clear about how you've gotten to where you are. Um, but no, absolutely, the project does not need to be finished um, before Congress. Um, and these, these are the uh, cities, the brigades that are already in the pilot. Um, a lot of them are, in, are uh, community fellows. Because I think there's someone from Buffalo on the call um, who is different than the person who is potentially a community fellow in Buffalo. Um, but we're hoping to get about 20 pilots. So we're looking for at least another eight brigades to pilot. And if you told me that you would pilot and you're not up here, I apologize. Um, so yeah, so that's the, that is the, the, um, yeah, that is the impact cascade challenge. Um, what, would it make sense for to do it for our day of action project? Um, that is beyond, oh, just to do it for that project. Um, so I, I will call on uh, Veronica to correct me if I'm wrong, but I would see no. So I guess, I guess my question is, is the day of action project, is it um, a piece of technology? Because this is designed for a piece of, for creating something like a, an app or an open data portal, or it is, it does have that kind of specific use case in mind. So if that's consistent with your day of action project, then sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know, Mary, you might be able to provide more advice given the context. So um, there were three actions that the network prioritized for the day of action. And one is, is journey mapping um, mm. for the record clearance process in your location. Um, the second action is um, a usability scorecard for services mm. associated with record clearance in your location. And then the third is a know your rights website. So that is more technical on the technical side, um, mm -hmm. making, making that site. So those are the three prioritized mm -hmm. actions which mm -hmm. the brigades will be doing their projects around. Yeah, um, I guess I would put that all of those actions sound like impacts to be tracking during the development of the tool. Um, and if we do this example with Jill's project, you can kind of see how the actual work of developing a tool is becomes part of the cascade. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, usability definitely is something that you can kind of give yourself credit for uh, in the cascade. Um, let us, yeah, so, so let's figure, these are some options of what we can do next. This is the kind of choose your own adventure part. So we can see an example cascade. Uh, which is seeing how an actual project did a cascade, and that would be reentry roadmap, which is actually, I think, connected to the day of action theme, at least, um, which Jill would go through. Um, we can also learn how to make a cascade, which is seeing a kind of a diagram with steps. Um, and there's time we can make a cascade. Um, if, you, if you do have the deck open, uh, you can kind of see at the end there's a lot of blank um, project, there's a lot of blank diagrams, so we could kind of, you know, take 10 minutes and start filling them in and see what questions come up. Um, we can talk about harms, um, since there's a request on Slack. Uh, and then we can talk about logistics of actually making this happen, like how do you select a project, uh, getting buy-in from members if you feel like that's necessary, um, the su support, you know, accessing support, do you have enough support, and other other requests as necessary. So if you have a preference, please share in the chat. And then I'll kind of take a loose 
kind of consensus process about what we cover and in what order. And we have about, yeah, 25 minutes. So we can do probably a couple of these things. Okay, interested in harms and how to do it, okay. Okay, logistics and how to do it, okay. All right, yeah, I have an example. All right, yeah, I'll just let a few more people vote. Example, okay, I feel like I should have, <laughs> have a piece of note paper here. Okay, so it looks like we have do an example, um, learn how to make it, and then maybe when we learn how to make it, we could also talk about harms, or maybe we could even talk about harms. I know maybe Jill, if you want to, you can talk about harms um, and finish up with the logistics. And then probably not, it seems like we probably won't have time to start one, but. Um, okay, so I'll just go into, yes, Jill providing an example. So you just, Jill, tell me when uh, to advance the slides and I will do that. Ooh. Okay, hi hey, everyone. Um, so uh, me and Jeff are working on a uh, re-entry roadmap. Um, we have a, a slide deck for it. Do you guys want me to share it? Do you want me to add it into the chat? Not that it's, ah. If I knew how to copy and paste, then that would be like one thing, but yeah, that. Do you think, Jill, do you think that you can do to talk about it in the slides in the stack? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think that will just save time yeah. rather than slipping, yeah, slipping between the decks. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so what we're creating is a customizable roadmap for uh, reentry services. So um, we kind of started to break out our project in each phases, um, which is actually really helpful because I think we don't think it, I, yeah, I, we didn't think about the impact and stuff. So, um, where's, maybe advanced to the next one. Where's the one that actually has our things on it? All, all yeah. of them? Just all of them? Well, either that or any of them. Okay. So, um, our first phase is the tool creation, right? So, um, we're very focused on having the community participate in our tool creation itself. So um, in this one, we've actually have a little bit of impact that we've been able to measure. Um, so we thought about like how many people are giving us input. We interviewed 70 people total. Um, how many partners are involved? Right now we have 15. Um, we're still creating a group of uh, community members to do the user testing. So that one I don't have a number for. But then we're just basically like how, during this whole research phase of what kind of tool we want to create, how many, it's focused on how many people participate. Um, and that's the biggest impact that we could gauge for that research phase um, to make sure that we're getting a good uh, frame of like from people who are actually, you know, actually going to use it. Um, and then when we start talking about like our tool actually creating and using the tool, um, we're interested in knowing like uh, how many pages they're looking at, like who's using it. Um, how far are they getting? Like, when are they, like, are they getting hung up someplace? Are they, um, and this one has a lot of, this is where our harm comes in a lot. Um, and that tool creation, having a solid basic community is important for our project. Um, because we're really focused on the way we set up the tool, not creating more harm. Um, we do talk about some sensitive things like mental health and, um, the way, you know, like your living situation and, um, you know, life goals. And sometimes when it's super happy and cheerful, like social media version, people are happy to share that. But when, um, you know, we need to talk to you about, like, are you getting the mental health services that you need? Uh, we're very focused on not creating more harm by the way we ask the questions. And so those partners that are helping us create that language in that um, framework is, is really important for us on this front. And then um, because our ultimate goal is to decrease the reentry anxiety, which was the number one thing that when we were asked what, when I asked those 70 people what the greatest barrier is for their reentry, almost all of them said some version of anxiety, a feeling overwhelmed. Um, so 
our goal is to create something that helps reduce that, um, which also coincides a lot with what Indianapolis's fellowship project is also focused on is creating is decreasing that anxiety. So uh, what's cool about this individual effect, we're talking a lot with Indianapolis about how do we, uh, how do we set up the system to gauge, to measure this kind of impact where it's, we're using the same tools. Um, and then ultimately our goal is to cause some institutional effects, not just individuals. Um, for us, that is how many reentry services, how many facilities this is in, um, how early can we get this tool to them? Um, our goal is that you start looking at this tool the day you're in admission. Um, so as soon as you walk, as soon as you are set up in your admissions um, to do active time, we want you thinking about your reentry and how we can set up that time while you're uh, inside to help you successfully reenter society. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of like the different phases and how we set up that impact. Uh, do you have some questions? Thoughts? Anyone? Yeah, so I actually asked. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was just going to, um, I put this in the chat, but I was just curious. Okay. How do you sort of um, vet the, these particular measures or sort of how do, you, how do you get to the point where you feel confident that these are the right measures to be looking at uh, and that they're accurately reflecting the goal? Um, so I think the first, like the tool creation is pretty easy because building, you know, making sure that we're building with our community. It's the tool use that's a, it's a little bit harder. But one of the things that was nice about this process was for us is that when, while we're while Jeffrey's actively developing the tool, he's thinking about how does he incorporate things like analytics for the page process without it being intrusive in the design effort. Um, and how do you know like how do we collect that kind of data without actually collecting any personal identifying identifying information? Our goal is to not collect very much of that at all, if any. Um, so. Yeah, so um, right now the tool is kind of being set up to, in, for that, any of that tool use data, for it to be collecting automatically for itself. Um, I think possibly that in, we're still testing this one. Um, I have a user test group uh, in two weeks where we're going to talk about that, the individual effect part. Um, because I don't know if maybe it's a survey at the end where we ask a couple of questions. So you get all the way to the end and I ask you, you know, we ask, do you, how do you feel about this process? Like, how are you, do you feel like you have the next step? Do you feel like you have, you know, you now have at least some of the tools that you need or know where to go get those tools that you need? Um, but I don't know if a survey is a good idea after I just ask them to answer a whole bunch of questions. So um, that one we don't, for like a collection point, we don't really have a good answer just yet. That's going to come through our testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is kind of the biggest kind of meta theme of, of Cascades is, is adaptation, which is that you're, as you're moving through making that cascade, you're, you can say, oh, I thought the best way to measure this three months ago was asking this question via a survey or asking this question via interview, or asking this question via email correspondence. But as you're actually learning and doing and getting information, you may say, actually, the best way to get this information is something totally different. So you definitely want to, you can definitely change your cascade as you're moving through it, and you have a better idea of how everything is working. I don't know, Jill, if you have any examples of doing that yet. Um, I think closest the, the closest thing we have is like um, a brainstorm of like I am developing three different ways that you can do the individual. One is a survey. One um, is so one's an individual survey to the user. One is um, a monthly one that goes out to the resource providers, and then another one is in-person interviews, um, which we found when we did the interviews that those we got the best feedback when we talked to people in person. But um, it's also, uh, we're trying to build something to help a community that doesn't have a lot of spare time and doesn't have, you know, like, um, where are the best places for me to go to talk to them to get that kind of 
feedback. So uh, we're going to test out three different ways and see which one is the best received. Cool. Um, yeah, and, and also just to remember, um, this is a fine point, and you know we can re redo this uh, or review this later. But just that remembering that your the question you're asking is separate is separate from your method of collection, right? So like survey is not a metric; survey is data collection method. And so you have a question or piece of information, then you say, okay, what are my options for how to collect it? Um, so thank you, Jill. Um, so oops, um, yeah. So. The next thing I'll show you is just um, how to, a basic process for how to make these things. Um, so uh, it's a work backward process. Um, so you start with uh, your, the goal of your project, right? And I would probably write that just as your desired impact. Um, and then you work your way backwards. Oh, sorry. Um, to, to look at like, okay, in order for that final impact to happen, if it's, you know, accessibility, if it's a particular kind of, you know, individual use, if it's a institutional effect, it's like whatever the scale of the goal of your project is, you put it in that last um, frame. Um, and then you move back and you kind of ask yourself, in order for that to happen, what are the immediate preconditions that we need to have? You know, what do we need to do? And you can actually, you can use, definitely use the, the format from Jill's project um, as just to start you off so you don't have to be kind of pulling everything out of the air. Um, but you do have this flexibility. Um, so you, um, you work back basically until you get to the phase where you kind of are now or your your next proximal phase and that's where you stop. Um, and I would say after you come up with that big picture, um, that is when you fill in the impacts because the, I'm sorry, that is when you fill in the metrics. So you have the, the impact which is in pink is kind of a qualitative description of what you're trying to achieve and the metrics are quantitative ways of measuring that impact. So you put your, you do your different impacts qualitatively. This is what we're trying to choose at the end. In order to do that, we need this precondition. In order to do that, we need this precondition. In order to do that, we need to do this in our development process or in our project planning process. And then what are kind of quantitative ways that we can see how we're doing so we can kind of diagnose and adapt our process and, and improve it. Um, so, any comments on that? Does that seem reasonable? And also, I mean, if you find that you fill it out in a different way, then that's also fine. Um, that is, any, I guess, any, any questions? Because this is the thing to, to do the pilot is sitting down. And I guess we can, we can slide into logistics. Um, so being part of the pilot means doing this for a project. Um, so we could also talk about how do you work in kind of assessing it, um, uninten unintended harms into this. If you want to talk about that, um, I guess, yeah, for those of you, um, hopefully many of you that are considering actually being part of this pilot challenge, um, what kind of lingering doubts or concerns do you have on, on doing this? Or are there any obstacles or blockers that you can foresee? We're doing this. So does that, does the silence mean that everyone's just gung ho or that no one is gung ho? To yeah, do this. when you were saying the qualitative, this is bad. Um, when you're saying the qualitative uh, ones and sort of pointing that, is that on this slide? Uh, then the quantitative metrics yeah. are the metric one, two, three. Yeah, so qual qualitative is, is the impact, desired impact. So if we go back to Jill's example, um, so she's saying qualitatively for tool creation, she wants to measure, she has the goal of having community participation in the creation of her tool. 
And so she's coming up with specific things that are measurable and quantitative that will help her assess, is she getting community participation? Um, likewise for tool use, she has the goal of an easy user experience and that there is information of interest, right? So that's kind of qualitative, descriptive, and then she's coming up with metrics. And also the, the less metrics, the better, right? So you don't have to have as many as Jill has. Um, if you have one metric that's kind of like, you know, a KPI key performance indicator you feel is giving all your information, then, then that's good. It's not, it's not considered better to have more because um, it's more work, right? Um, and then moving on qualitatively, they're seeking to decrease re-entry anxiety. And then to actually measure that, there's this numeric scoring system. I think it's, it's like a, a quiz where you, people are, you know, giving information about different behaviors or different emotions that they're experiencing. And then from that, you know, you can identify someone's anxiety level. Um, and then institutional adoption qualitatively is a goal, is a goal, is the impact. And then it's like, well, how are we going to measure institutional adoption. It's like, well, we can number, measure the number of reentry centers or when and when or how many people are, you know, um, using the tool at a particular phase in the process. I think that is something Jill said. Um, Excellent, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I guess, uh, I've got about eight minutes. Um, I do want to take a little bit of time to talk about this intended, this unintended harms. Um, and I'd actually like to open it up because I think it's, it is kind of challenging to think about how do we take into account things that we're not expecting to happen. Because all the plan is all about these are our intentions, right? Um, so if anyone has any thoughts about how they they have in the past taken account of unintended harms that would be useful um jill spoke about it a little um i feel like there's kind of some safeguards like making sure you're really in close contact with your users um and listening to their concerns as well as their this would be great listening to some say and this would really not be great um that's kind of a way to avoid harms um is yeah that at Cover boston we kind of talk about anti-goals when we're starting a new project um with the with the partner organization and that that's a good way to frame it so we have the goal that goals that where you definitely don't want to go and i guess that sort of captures the harms um but it'd be great to have an even broader conversation that wasn't just with the partner organization that wasn't just what with the partner organization mm-hmm Sorry, Tad, you cut out a bit during, I uh, didn't quite catch the, um, what you were saying about anti-goals. Uh, yeah, so anti-goals are obviously the opposite of goals. And when, during new project intake, uh, we have a conversation with the partner or the project champion to really think through um, what their anti-goals for the project might be and that those can anticipate some harms. So how do you um, define that for your partners? Like what we don't want to happen, yeah, like what, or what we're afraid of. Uh, yeah, because usually they're coming. They're they're the project champion, so they're suggesting it. Usually they have a, they have sort of a, an idea in their head about what they want to happen, and if I start posing kind of ideas about my, what I could imagine, they could the, on the sort of edges of what I could imagine, given what they're saying, they'll sometimes push back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see it. Like I'm trying trying to apply it to my own project right now, where we have a partner who has a lot of reservations about working with um, uh, organizations outside their community. Um, and so I think for them, one of their anti goals would probably be around, you know, not feeling heard, not being heard, not being um, able to exert uh, input and control over the process. Uh, yeah, wow. So I like the idea of an anti goal It's a helpful framework. Yeah, and that's that. It also does um, lend itself well to the to the model. So you could even, you know, write, you know, below or in some part of each square if there's kind of anti goals per phase, maybe. Um, 
But I definitely like the idea of working anti-goals into this pilot because I feel we're, we're kind of, we're testing out how do we measure impact? And, you know, this is a nice way to measure the benefits and how do we measure the harms, anti-goals? You know, it's a tested approach from, I think, Boston. And it's like, let's try it. Let's all, let's all. And if you, if something else comes up, um, you can also do that, but um, that seems like a good approach. I'm seeing Scott. Sounds maybe attributed to the quality of the explanation. You use a key performance indicator. You can just, okay, you're kind of explaining something that's going on. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so I do want to give us a little time for next steps in logistics. We've got about four minutes. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, basically from this call, I'm planning to reach out to you all by email to ask if you'd like to pilot, uh, just so that I can have a sense of who's in the cohort. And by pilot, I mean, do the challenge, um, you know, create this, um, a cascade uh, before um, Congress. So is there anything that would be useful for us to handle on this call before I simply reach out to you all as individuals? You know, if your whole concept, another step might be to ask what happens if this goes wrong. Right. Yeah, I feel like that's a good um, kind of prompt to get at anti goals. Right. Um, yeah, that does make sense. Uh, and then I guess the idea would be to come up with some, I don't know if it would be a metric, but getting specific around evidence. You know, how would we know if this anti goal has happened? Um, so maybe, maybe it ends up looking like, a, like two tiers of um, kind of phases that you have a box, like an impact and then metrics for benefit and impact and, and measurements for harms, I guess, is one way to do that um, and see how, how practical that is. Um, yeah. Uh, any any final thoughts or questions that feels useful before? Um, um, yeah. How do you think that because the some of the projects, at least in Comfort Boston, tend to have a, a fairly fluid uh, membership with a, a little bit of a core? Uh, what's a good way to keep something like this surfaced? What do you mean by surfaced? Like uh, visible to everyone as you're going through how. Uh, Jill, do you think that it's going to be important? It's going to be important to uh, to keep this very visible. Or are these just things you check on everyone? No, I think so. For us, our System project, stuff. yeah, our project management is in a Trello board, and it's the number one resource. It's in the the getting started resources section. So every time we get a new team team member that wants to join it, I expect them to read that section. Okay. Um, I'll say that the way that I'm planning to pilot it in Seattle is working. I did a presentation for the whole brigade at a monthly meeting and then whoever raised their hand or came up to me at the end and said, I'd like to work with you and make one. That was how I identified the project. So it was just everyone knew about it. And then whoever came up and said they wanted to do it. That was fine because this is, this is like absolute earliest adopters, right? Um, so there's definitely gonna be some people that kind of want it to be tested and more <laughs> worked out before they try it. And that's to be expected and totally okay. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying too. Yeah, that's sort of the yeah. broader keeping it surfaced to, to try to get a, someone to, to a project to volunteer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, all right, we got about one more minute. I'm just gonna check the chats. Um, Hey, John, Jill, show, show there, share the link. Okay, this is, that's a question just for Jill. Um, okay, awesome. So thank you. Um, I will um, follow up with you individually about piloting and next steps and coaching and getting into the details. Um, and if you have not received an email from me and you are part of the impact team from Brigade Day, that means that things are going into spam and I am having trouble with that. So please Slack me if you have not received an email from me about this. Um, and you gave me your email at, at Summit. Um, so I will say that. Um, yeah, 
So thank you so much for coming and I look forward to working with you on this and to learning with you um, about how we can measure impact. So yeah, thank that's all so I got. Thank you for hosting, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, good night. Thank you.